evening. Hello, everyone. My name is Noemi Bolaños, and I'm a student at Clarksburg High School. I'd like to welcome you all to tonight's webinar program called Mel Melting Glaciers, Rising Seas. Before we start, I want to acknowledge our sponsor, One Montgomery Green, which is a nonprofit organization promoting sustainability in Montgomery County, and our coordinator, Laura Bartnitz. SAPLINGS stands for Student Advocates Protecting the Planet, and we're a group open to Montgomery County High School students in grades 9 through 12 who are interested in the environment and sustainability. And I promise it really doesn't matter where you attend high school. Um, if you attend a public high school or if you attend a private high school or even if you're homeschooled, you can be a part of our SAPLINGS programs. We host online and live student forums, as well as workshops and public webinars. And you will also see our contact details in the chat if you have any questions. We're very, very, very pleased to offer you tonight's program, which tackles an extremely important environmental issue related to climate change that will have consequences for the entire world at large, including Maryland, the Chesapeake Bay and our coastal communities. We'll learn more tonight about the science behind melting glaciers, its relation to climate change, what the impacts may be, and touch upon what is being done to prevent the worst effects in our area. We will have two presenters tonight with us, Dr. Richard Alley and Jeremy Cox, and I will introduce them one at a time um, once it is their turn to speak, um, and they'll have their chance to make their presentations and tell us more about melting glaciers. Um, and we'll also open the floor to questions as well as discussion. During the discussion period, we really welcome you to raise your hand to share your comments or put your questions or comments in the chat. And um, please be aware that this webinar is being recorded. Um, and with that being said, let's get started. So I will introduce our first speaker today, which is Dr. Richard Alley. Um, Dr. Richard Alley received his PhD in Geosciences in 1987, and he's currently a professor at Penn State. He studies the Antarctic and Greenland ice sheets to help predict future climate and sea level changes. Honored for research, teaching, and service, Dr. Alley participated in the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, where he provided requested advice to high government officials. He was co-recipient of the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize and has authored or co-authored over 300 referred scientific papers. He was a presenter for the PBS TV miniseries, Earth, the Operator's Manual, based on his book. His popular account of climate change and ice cores, the two, two, the two Mile Time Machine, was Phi Beta Kappa's science book of the year. He is happily married with two grown daughters, a bicycle, and a pair of soccer cleats. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ali. Well, thank you, Noemi. It is an honor and a privilege to be here. I'm just going to go ahead and share the screen and get the PowerPoint to show up here, I hope. So, um, and thanks to, to those of you who are who are attending here. It's 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 great to see you and to have you spending your evening with us. And good heavens, why did it do that? We'll make this work here in just a moment. So um, there we go. Okay, so we got it. Um, so this is what we're gonna gonna talk about. And I will get a pointer here so I can scribble on it. And so thank you. So just a warning, first of all, we have two cats, two kittens, brand new rescues that we just got. They have been playing around here. And if something climbs my leg and I yelp, you'll know what's going on. So, so just, just, just there's the warning. Um, I want to thank Noemi, the, the Laura Shursty who helped set this up. Jeremy is going to give you all sorts of useful things. Uh, the whole program is really great. So, thank you all. Um, if you see a penguin, that's just to lighten up something that's a little bit heavy. So, they're from Antarctic trips I've taken in the past. I'm going to front for a lot of people. So um, we at Penn State are, are part of a larger community that's working on ice and uh, sea level. This is, uh, I'm going to tell you about Thwaites Glacier in West Antarctica. This is some of our team uh, in a previous trip in, in Thwaites Glacier in West Antarctica. Um, I'm in geosciences. These are some of our current geosciences grad students working in this topic. Um, 
Amanda is on her way to the ice. Um, we have collaborators across the street. So these are some of the, the grad students over in geography working on this topic. It's an amazing group. Some of the more senior people, um, both Don and Nate are headed for the ice. Um, and so we'll see. I'll show you some stuff from Dave Pollard here a little later. Um, Sridhar is on the ice at the moment, uh, waiting people coming down. And this is me back when I was younger and my beard was redder. So at any rate, what I'm going to cover for you, sea level rise is almost guaranteed, and we are not done with it, even if we do good things. Um, but strong warming could generate a lot more rise than people are expecting because of well-known, previously observed, but really hard to model processes that are not fully included in most comprehensive models. So that's where we're going. So, but let's back off first for a minute and do the biggest picture, right? Because be honest, the news about climate is not always good. I see a lot of people who have climate angst, climate depression, they're worried. And so before you let it get too bad, remember what the UN, what the IPCC reports really say, which is if we use our knowledge efficiently. If we use our knowledge, we don't pretend that I'm an evil liar. We use that knowledge efficiently. We get a larger economy. That was the Nobel Prize in economics with more jobs. We're healthier. Our nations are more secure. And oh, by the way, the environment is cleaner and we're more ethical. Right now, the economy, the ethics, the environment are all in the same direction, which is using our knowledge. We can do this. And it's a different talk, and I call me back someday and I'll, I'll do this one for you. Students today are the first generation in all of human history that knows that they could build a sustainable energy system that will power everyone cleanly, efficiently, ethically, essentially forever, right? We, we really can do this, okay? And if we don't, be honest, the sea is going to rise. It might rise a lot. All right, so these are the data. This is satellite altimetry looking at the elevation of the ocean. The ocean is rising. That's only, you know, four inches since 19, it's three millimeters a year. It's only four, the cat is in the way since 1993, but it already matters. Now I have swiped these pictures from the sites that are noted down here. I'm not showing you Maryland. Jeremy can do that later. I'm showing you Florida. This is not a storm in Florida. They're having one now. This is not a storm. It's just a high tide. This is not a canal. It's a street. This is what they call adaptation. Right? Don't splash the salt water on my flowers. We have a no wake zone sign in the middle of the street. This is a parking garage. It is not a storm. It's a high tide. The octopus swam in there. They call this nuisance flooding. But if you have seen pictures of collapsing condominiums, rusting the supports in the, in the concrete might worry you. And then at some point, what happens? You have water problems. You have big problems. And so one of the things that's important, nuisance flooding becomes high impacts and high costs. The cost goes up faster than the, than the ocean does because we built for a little variability, we've used that up and now we're going into the, the expensive part. So go back to the data, why? And global average, it is more or less one third, ice in the mountains is melting, the water ends up in the ocean, the ocean rises. It is more or less one third, the ocean is expanding as the water warms. And it is more or less one third melting of the ice sheets, Greenland and Antarctica, mainly melting on the surface of Greenland. This changes a little bit from year to year and month to month, but more or less it's that. We're mining groundwater in some places that gets to the ocean, but we're building dams in others, that's sort of a wash. And then there's a huge number of local to regional issues. Uh, Maryland is getting a little extra sea level rise because you're sinking because of the end of the ice age. Uh, New Orleans is sinking because it's built on mud that is compacting. Um, there's a whole bunch of local things that go on. Okay, But more or less for the globe average, 
mountain glaciers, expanding ocean, and the, and the ice sheets. Okay? But if you ask what could they do, it's the ice sheets and the ice sheets and the ice sheets. All of the ice in all the mountain glaciers in the world is, is a third of a meter. You know, it's just over a foot of sea level. And then there's nothing left. You can't, can't raise it more because there's no ice. The ocean rises, you know, a foot or two, something like that, a, a half a meter from a degree of warming, but that takes a thousand years um, because the ocean is so big, it takes a long time to warm. But Greenland, you can see the numbers there, 7.3 meters, 24 feet, Antarctica, serious. Okay. So if you talk about sea level rise, if these really matter, sea level rise is small and we're lucky. Now, I did, this is us in 2007 in, in UNESCO in, in Paris, writing the IPCC. Um, this is the most authoritative body. I'm going to criticize them a little bit, but be very clear that I hugely support what they do. They're fantastic. They're very important. And if I complain a little, it's with respect. So this is what they said in the most recent projections. Sea level has been rising. We are committed, even under low warming, we're committed to more rise than we've seen. By the year 2100, we're gonna get more, um, but it's still that sort of half a meter, you know, a foot and a half, something like that. If we crank temperature up, we can double it. And then they put this thing on, which is, well, maybe it'll double again. And as I'm going to show you, this is not even close to a worst case scenario. It could be much worse than that, okay? So we're committed to sort of half a meter. We could double that if we strong warm. We could double that or more if we really strong warm and things go bad. It's worth pointing out, uh, this is from, from IPCC numbers, and I'll change it to the words there. The IPCC consistently has been low relative to what happened. So in 1990, they said sea level will rise along the blue curve. In 2001, they said, well, maybe along the green curve. What happened? It's the red and the orange. These are two different data sets. It's risen faster than they projected. And when you look in the literature, you find there's a whole lot of scientific literature saying it will be higher than what the IPCC said. That is in part because of this. Those high-end projections, the, the quantified ones, a meter by 2100, in those, Greenland loses 2% of its mass. Strongest warming, 2% is gone from Greenland. 0.2% from Antarctica. It is really, really hard to be better than that. It is really, really easy to be worse. And so because they are using models that don't lose a lot of mass from, from the big ice sheets, sea level rise is small. Now, small, still three feet under strong warming by 2100 is serious, but that keeps 99.8% of Antarctica unmelted. And I'm going to show you that might not fall. So let me tell you about ice sheets. This is Kurt Coffey. Kurt studied with us as an undergrad. He's a very important professor at Berkeley. He wrote the textbook in our field, The Physics of Glaciers. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna teach you the physics of glaciers. I, we're actually teaching this grad class right now. This is what we're talking about right here. We don't have time to do the whole textbook, so I'm going to give you the 101 version. Right? This is my dear wife, Cindy, making pancakes. What is she doing? She's making a pile. The pressure under the pile is higher than the pressure outside, and so the pile tends to spread under its own weight. All piles tend to spread under their own weight because of that. What controls the rate of spreading? Well, how strong is it? How viscous? If you make it stronger, it slows down. If you hold it back, it slows down. If you put it on something that is bumpier or rougher, it slows down and it sort of looks cool. That is the fundamental physics. Piles spread. If there's 
stronger, they're slower. If you hold them back, they're slower. If it's bumpier, they're slower. This is a satellite image of the Juno ice fields in Alaska. If you go to Juno and you fly in, this is the airport. If you go in from the, the um, cruise ship, this is the cruise ship. Um, green is trees, white is the snow. What's happened? It snows faster than it melts up on the mountains. The snow piled up until it made a pile. The pile spreads under its own weight, just like Cindy's waffle. Now, you can see Cindy spreading down the waffle iron. If you go up on the cruise ship, you may go see the Mendenhall Glacier spreading down the waffle iron of the Juno ice fields. It is exactly the same thing. Pile spreading under its own weight on a waffle iron. If you go up here, what does it actually look like? Well, this is Kaya Riverman and Don Voigt, Penn Staters teaching at the Juno Icefields Project. So that's what it looks like. But that's what it is. It's Cindy's waffle spreading. And these are giant mungo piles of old snow squeezed to ice and spreading under their own weight. Now, if we had a lot of time or you came and studied with us and, and you take our class, we would talk about changes in the strength. This is a thin section, it's a few inches. And um, those different crystals have different orientations that affect how they deform. It changes, it matters, but it doesn't change really fast. So we're not gonna focus on the strength here. This is in Greenland, the ice flows over that waffle iron and sometimes there's low spots. And in the low spots, you can get meltwater in the summer. This is a lake, it's a mile across. It's 40, 50 feet deep in the middle. And these are crevasses. This is Sarah Doss. Sarah went up to watch the lake break through the crevasse. She is standing in the middle of the lake except the lake drained to the bottom of the ice sheet by wedging open the crevasse. It did twice Niagara Falls for an hour. The glacier raised up, it lurched sideways, it flowed faster, there were earthquakes, it was truly dramatic. She was not in the lake in her boat when it drained, and thank goodness for that. But the ice didn't fall in the ocean because it's on a waffle iron, not a greased griddle. So we're not going to focus on that very much either, although we'll come back to Sarah in a little bit. What we are going to focus on is the spatula, holding it back. And then we're going to switch analogies. The builders of Gothic cathedrals discovered this pile spreading. They had a tendency for the roofs to cave in and the walls to bulge out. And they developed the flying buttress to oppose that spreading tendency. The flying buttress does for the Gothic cathedral what Cindy's spatula did for the pancake. It holds it back. And here's the analogy to the ice sheets. Where the pile flows down to the ocean, if the air and the water are both really cold, the ice remains attached and it flows over the ocean. All of them run aground on a local high spot or they scrape past the sides of a fjord. That generates friction. That friction holds back the floating part, the flying buttress, the ice shelf, in the same way that the flying buttress holds back the Gothic cathedral. And that makes the pile bigger and the ocean smaller. In Antarctica, it is minus 50 up there. It is not going to melt in the very near future. This is almost melting. This is melting. A little warming. You knock out the flying buttress. The pile spreads faster and the ocean rises. So let me show you that. Everything in brown here is the ice shelves, the flying buttresses, the spatulas of Antarctica. All of the important flows, the fast flows into the ocean, are buttressed by an ice shelf, by, by a flying buttress. And um, except I'm going to show you one right up there in that pink square that used to be, but is not anymore. Okay, so here we are. The pink square was right over there in the corner. Um, black is ocean here. The, the, this is sort of an extension of the Andes with glaciers just dripping off of it. You can see the scale bar. These little icebergs are bigger than aircraft carriers. This flying buttress here, this ice shelf, formed 10,000 years ago as the ice sheet shrank from the ice age. 
It sat there for 10,000 years as of January 31st, 2002. And these funny things on here are Sarah's lakes. But remember, Sarah was looking at ice in Greenland that was on the waffle iron of, of a rough bed. These have ocean water underneath. And so what I'm going to do is show you five weeks back and forth. This is five weeks. Okay, this thing's retreating. You know, that's that's 50K, right? It, it's retreating at, at 10K or six miles a week. It fell apart. You could drive your kayak through the blue slushy up here. This is just broken up little bits of ice. So when the lakes broke through here, it just fell apart. And after it fell, that didn't raise sea level. This was floating. But after it fell apart, these things were no longer held back. They sped up a lot up to sevenfold. That contributes to sea level rise, but not much because there's only a little ice there. What we're worried about is this moving to now colder places and happening a lot faster. So let me show you the same thing in Greenland. We're going to fly in along the yellow arrow and we're gonna look at one of these flows coming out a groove in the waffle iron. It's called Jakobshaven Glacier. It was the world's fastest glacier. The, the water warmed by a degree. The ice shelf broke off and the speed tripled with what had been the fastest glacier. Okay. This is looking along the yellow arrow. The ice is flowing towards you on the blue arrow up there. This is tundra on the sides with musk oxen and stuff. And this is actually just sea ice and broken up icebergs floating on a very deep piece of ocean. It's all busted up. Uh, I'm going to show you two pictures. First, second. First is a seal, right? There's water under there. And the seals, they actually do oceanography with the seals. They put instruments on them. They swim around in the water. They come up and telemeter the data. Second, the seal was down here. This is a cliff, 100 meters, 330 feet, a 10-story building. Uh, I'm sorry, a 30-story building, 30-story building right? Plus nine times that much below because it's just right at floating. With the blue arrow, the ice is flowing in, okay? There used to be a giant flying buttress in here where it says seal down here. That's gone. It broke off. The Lincoln Memorial is shown to scale here relative to the cliff. The next picture I took in a helicopter with a bunch of U.S. senators who were up to see this. And it's right there in front of this cliff. There's the Lincoln Memorial. Get it out of the way. Again, this is a 30-story tall building that we're looking at. That's a 10-story high crack, right? This is close to breaking. It's about as close as you can get. I will show you how it breaks. Here we go. I'll run it backwards. That's a 50 story high splash. I mean, this is just fantastic. They make magnitude five and a half earthquakes. We can tell here in Penn State when one of these things breaks off in Greenland, okay, because we've got good seismometers. Okay, so this is just about as high as you can make a cliff, to be honest. It breaks, it waits a little while till it thins a bit. It breaks, it waits a little while. Um, but we've done some work, Byron Parizak works with us. If it were a lot higher, it would just break and break and break and break like that ice shelf did at the Larson B. And, and it would go fast, okay? So right now, this is tied for the highest ice cliff on the planet. If Thwaites Glacier retreats, it would try to make a much higher cliff. And our real worry is it retreats, it makes a huge cliff, it breaks really fast, sea level rises in a hurry. Okay, So we're going to go to Antarctica. Red is thinning, and there's Antarctica. If we take the ice off, the reds and yellows are rock that's above sea level. The blues are rock that's below sea level, but the ice is so thick that it's still not floating. This is an old rift. It's like Nevada. It's spread for a while, and it's got all these huge faults like Death Valley. So this is sort of Death Valley. The ice wants to flow along that, but it's built up in the middle, and it leaks out the side at Thwaites Glacier, which are those red arrows. 
And this is the analogy. You may understand this if you've ever driven near DC. Um, Thwaites right now is ending on a really shallow, narrow place. And it's like this traffic jam if there were another deck coming down. If Thwaites retreats because of warming water taking out its ice shelf, it would get back here, make the world's highest cliff, which would break really, really, really fast. Okay. So far, there's only one model that has succeeded in putting all those physics into the computer and in testing it against the history of the ice sheets and the sea level from past warmer times. And be honest, I helped a little with this. The work is mainly Dave Pollard and Rob DeCanto, but, I, but I'm on it a little bit. So, so that particular model, if we avoid strong warming, Antarctica behaves, it doesn't collapse, we're fine. If we drive strong warming, it retreats, it gets into those interior basins, and then it retreats fast. And it gives something like three meters or 11 feet in 100 years after it gets started, which is sometime this century. But we put a speed governor on the calving rate, it could go faster, okay? And there's some other stuff in Antarctica that could go faster. So I've helped a little bit sort of working with the National Academy of Sciences on, on what do we do with this? I'll be perfectly honest, the biggest issues about climate change are not climate, it's us, right? The big issues are, do we get together and solve the problems or do we shoot at each other? And really that's what matters is finding solutions. But of the physical parts, the things about climate, what we don't know yet, this particular issue, the possibility of losing a lot of mass from Antarctica in a hurry, expecting three feet of sea level rise and getting 12, that's a big deal. That's probably the single biggest uncertainty in this field. So let me summarize quickly. Sea level rise with warming is virtually guaranteed. Heat melts ice, it expands water. We're committed to some. Okay, the IPCC estimates, they are not alarmist. They may be low or very low. The uncertainties are grossly one-sided. Rise could be a little bit less. It could be a little bit more. It could be a lot more, not a lot less. Okay. Learning, research on this, hugely important. And what we understand in addition is that while we learn, avoiding warming would be very, very valuable. So I will stop right there and we'll see what we can do about questions. And um, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Ali, for this phenomenal presentation. I mean, you shared, thank you for sharing your wealth of knowledge on this topic. And I, you really were able to put the rising of sea level into perspective for us while also communicating how alarming it is. And I really, really, loved how visual all your explanations were. Um, it really allowed me to see the issue. I loved like the pancake and the flying buttress analogy and all the detailed satellite images um, because it really made me feel like I was in Antarctica and land with you, which I think is very important when it comes to um, putting all these issues into perspective because they can seem so large and so um, beyond our ourselves. Um, and so it is great to see the pictures and see the analogies to see how it applies not only to our lives, um, but what is already happening out there. So really, thank you so much. And um, I'm sure people have comments and questions. Um, I know people will be speaking through the chat as well as the Q&A section. Um, but in the meantime, I wanted to propose this question to you. And it was specifically about your uh, research work. Um, so throughout your time as a researcher in Antarctica and Greenland, um, I was particularly wondering what you found the most challenging, as well as what would you say was your biggest success? Um, because I know it is not easy to be out there in the field, um, being a pioneer in this, um, especially in climate change. Um, and so I'm so curious to know. <laughs> <laughs> the most challenging one, ages ago, in all of this history of the Antarctic program, the National mm -hmm. Science Foundation has melted a suite of samples exactly once. And my mm -hmm. PhD was in 
that set that melted. So I went to Antarctica, we collected the cores, we made the initial measurements, oh. we packed them up, they shipped them home and they melted them on the way home. And they didn't tell us, I'm doing geology, I'm studying the structure of the ice. We had the cores in plastic bags and other things. They just refroze them when they discovered it. So I am supposed to have snow turning to ice and I have these little refrozen ice cubes that were, oh, oh, oh what no. a bad morning. <laughs> what, a, what a bad morning when the, when the ice arrived home. But fortunately they, they made good. I got to Greenland and then I got back to Antarctica the next year and we got to do some stuff. Um, I mean, the biggest triumph is the people we've worked with and the things we've learned. But mm -hmm. we were we used to work a lot on abrupt climate change, and mm -hmm. there's there's a history that occasionally, usually, climate is a dial. A little more CO2, a little more sun, a little more sun blocking, whatever, and you change the temperature. Occasionally, there's <laughs> switches, and we had yeah. discovered one of these switches in an ice core in Greenland, and we're just looking there at, wow, the world changed. 11,650 years ago, the world mm -hmm. changed a huge amount in one year. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, I've, I've briefly learned about the ice core sampling um, in my environmental science class, and I can't even imagine when it, it's like the, the one thing you're studying and it just melts. It's, <laughs> it was a bad day. Away. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, never happened again. That, that was um, <laughs> one time mistake. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much um, for sharing with us. Um, and I really, really appreciate your presentation. And definitely, I I'm, want to explore this topic a lot more after hearing this. Um, and so I think now we're going to go on to our next speaker. Um, to learn more about this issue and how it applies to Maryland in specific, um, in particular. Um, so now I will introduce you all to our second presenter, which is journalist Jeremy Cox. Mr. Cox is a reporter with the Chesapeake Bay Journal, a nonprofit news organization that covers the environment in the 64,000 square mile Chesapeake watershed. He also hosts the journal's office podcast, Chesapeake Uncharted. The first season focused entirely on climate change. Jeremy also lives near Salisbury, Maryland and enjoys kayaking, bird watching, and running. And now I present Jeremy. <laughs> yay, yay, thank you so much. It's so good to be here. That, and that was, I, I second what everyone else has said there. That's uh, top five, top two best uh, climate change uh, presentations I've ever seen. That's great, Do Dr. Alley. Uh, I'll be shorter. Uh, but I just wanted to kind of bring uh, this kind of information home for us here. Uh, of course, climate change has, you know, many different consequences for us here. But um, I'm going to be focused mainly on um, sea level rise because we're talking about glaciers. And so when you have these uh, glaciers that are melting over time, okay, what does that mean here? Of course. Uh, so I, I think one thing I wanted to just kind of drive home the point uh, is that uh, we often think about sea level rise as happening in the future. And Dr. Alice, you know, said 100 years from now, we have to worry about this and that. Um, and he, he did mention at the start of the uh, talk that, yeah, we've seen about, uh, what was it, like six inches since 1993? Right. Um, it's happening now. You know, yes, sea level rise has been happening since at least the last ice age, but because we keep pumping so much carbon dioxide and, and uh, methane and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, we are supercharging that effect. And uh, that's the result that you have. Uh, and, and so you can actually see it on the, on the landscape. Uh, this picture you see behind me here uh, is about 20 miles from my house on the eastern shore of Maryland. It's in the Deal Island National Wildlife uh, Refuge, and it's uh, a marsh uh, where <clears throat> over time you have these storms come through, uh, water, wind, tide brings the water onto the landscape. Sometimes in low spots the water collects and it doesn't really drain out quick enough, and over time it really causes uh, the land to convert to water uh, from the inside out. 
So you often think of sea level as sort of eroding the edges, but here, uh, this is actually happening on the inside. And so this is just taken just about a year or so ago. You get the idea. Uh, hop over to my presentation here. Like I said, pretty quick, just focusing on, <clears throat> on Maryland here, try not to go over anything that we've talked about already. But it's important to understand, and, and Dr. Ali had uh, mentioned this, that uh, sea level rise is not uh, the same everywhere. The, the ocean isn't a bathtub, okay? Uh, certain areas uh, due to some, uh, we'll talk about that in the next slide, are rising faster. <clears throat> and so here, this is, we're, we're using the same data. I'm glad to see it. Uh, all of my stuff comes from the IPCC as well. Uh, or as it's been, you know, number crunched by NOAA, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, or by NASA. And so here is a graphic showing in the hotter spots, the redder, oranger spots, where relative sea level rise is, is expected to be uh, faster than in other areas. And so, yeah, okay, New Orleans, that makes a lot of sense right there. They have sinking land because, uh, you know, they've done a lot of oil development and that sort of thing over the years um, in the coastal areas. But another one I want to draw your attention to is, hey, right here by us here in the mid-Atlantic, what's going on there? Well, um, like I said, sea level rise can be different in various areas. Uh, I'm not a scientist. I just want to say that up front. But, you know, some of these things might be the ocean circulation. Uh, we see the... Uh, uh, the Gulf Stream off of our shores uh, in the Atlantic starting to slow down uh, the oscillation there, and that's going to have impacts about how much water piles up in our area. Uh, the local temperature might have an impact, uh, how much water you can store on the land, and probably the biggest thing is what's called subsidence, and Dr. Alley mentioned that before. We are sinking here in Maryland uh, because the ice sheets press down on us a good, you know, 10, 20,000 years ago. And I love the, uh, I, 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 like him, uh, I love the, the pancake batter um, uh, metaphor. I'm going to give you one sitting on a mattress. Uh, what happened was, you know, think about the glacier as sitting on the mattress, like on the edge of the mattress, like you would when you plop down on your bed. Okay, that presses down. Well, look what happens when you're sitting on your, your mattress, right? You look to your left, you look to your right, the mattress pops up a little bit right? What happens when you get up? All right, the part beneath you and every, it rises a little bit, obviously, because your weight's not there anymore, but the parts that were on the side where the glacier was not before, those go back down. And so that's what's happening right now where we're at. We didn't have the glaciers right on top of us. They were our neighbors. And now here in Montgomery County, you know, down where we are, etc., we're still going back down. So the water's going up, as the land is coming down. And so relatively speaking, sea level rise is happening here more. Uh, these, uh, based on which scenario we end up with, will uh, determine how much the sea level rises. Uh, IPCC in its latest report uh, has said with basically no actions to curb uh, climate change. And I believe this corresponds with that, uh, that highest curve that we saw in Dr. Alley's presentation there, uh, the 8.5 uh, number there that you saw, we can expect uh, a warming of about three to six degrees Celsius, uh, so a few more degrees than that um, in uh, Fahrenheit terms. And that would give us, by 2050, one foot, about a foot and a half increase, and by 2100, four feet of sea level rise. So four feet, you know, this the size of your little brother or sister, you know, the size you were when you were eight, nine, 10, 11 years old. Uh, imagine that on top of the current water level. And this all, by the way, corresponds to the mouth of the bay. Uh, so it's a little bit less when you get further up to like Baltimore, uh, that sort of area, but just you know, we need, we need to pick a spot. What happens if we do kind of hold the line on greenhouse gases, like, uh, like Dr. Alley said, some of this, I'm, I'm sorry to report, is, is baked in. It, we're we're going to see sea level rise, even if we, you know, put a lid on all of our uh, greenhouse gas emissions. 
but this is kind of a little bit better. This scenario is a little bit better than what we're on track for, but if we do take some actions, we could keep it under 2.4 degrees Celsius. Um, then you're looking at, again, because things are baked in in the near term, we're still looking at about a foot and a half, maybe just a little bit less than a foot and a half increase. And then instead of four, excuse me, four feet, we get two and a half feet increase. So that difference, okay, we, we business as usual, hey, we're having fun, hey, let's, you know, drive our gas cars and keep the lights on all day, four feet versus we take some action, we grow our economy in different ways, but we live more sustainably, we keep it to two and a half feet, what's that mean for us? And so this comes from um, the, the, the NOAA website where they kind of game out some of these scenarios. And so on the left, you see a street um, in Baltimore near Fells Point, if you're familiar with the area, kind of near, just um, a little downstream from the, the uh, Inner Harbor there. Uh, that's what happened to this, uh, would happen rather, to this, not a real picture, it's an illustration, to uh, Thames Street uh, right there. And then on the right, that's how it looks today, but that's how it would still look if you kept it to two feet, uh, the sea level. All right, so that's a pretty big difference. If you, you live in Baltimore, uh, you know, a good chunk of your community might no longer be habitable uh, in those two scenarios, between those two scenarios anyway. Uh, same thing, um, if you've ever heard of Smith Island, it's the only inhabited island in the Maryland side of the Chesapeake Bay that you can only get to by boat. Uh, it's uh, way to the south part of uh, Maryland, and uh, about 200 people live out there, 150 or so. This is what it looks like today, okay? And you can see here, this is the community of Ewell. It's got a couple of ridges on it uh, that people live on. Uh, what happens when you pile up four feet of uh, water on top of them? Uh, basically, this area on the left is all that's left is basically where they, you know, the Indian, the, the uh, Native Americans before us uh, piled up shells and then, you know, other detritus was, was placed and then nothing else, basically open water. They're gone by 2100. Uh, over here, two, just a mere two feet there, you can just still kind of make out maybe where they're at, uh, but maybe they still have a chance. Uh, at that scenario, maybe, you know, you can put in some flood walls and save what you have there, but certainly four feet, um, you know, where people have been living for hundreds of years as uh, since white settlers came and, and thousands of years uh, before that, uh, our actions have put them underwater. Uh, and, ju and just since I wanted to point out one last thing, because you were talking about 10 or 12 feet, of, uh, of water if we lose that ice shelf down in West Antarctica. You know, I wanted to kind of show what that would look like because I only, I only thought of like four feet, you know, I'm, I'm an optimist, sorry. Um, so here's what Maryland looks like now. Let's take this, this is again NOAA's website. Let's crank it all the way up to 10 feet. Yeah, all that blue is now underwater. Again, before land, okay, this is my house here crank it up. Now I've almost got waterfront property. All of Dorchester County is gone. Um, we come in here on Annapolis a little bit. Most of that uh, is now just a, a narrow finger of land. Baltimore, uh, much of that is lost. Uh, so this is real for us, especially here in Maryland. And um, uh, the we have a choice is what it comes down to um, as a society, as decision makers, as our individual things that we do. Uh, we can make choices that make the planet more hospitable for the future, for, for you guys, for your kids, or um, we, we can keep going the way we are and have to uh, fight over what land we have left. So thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Cox, for your presentation and complimenting Dr. Ali's presentation so well. Um, I think when a lot of us think about 
climate change or even just a normal person, you know, like they, they think about the wildfires, they think about the glaciers melting, you know, all those pictures that you see in the movie scenes, but, you know, they're not necessarily thinking or even might know that, you know, this is happening right in the town that they live in or that their neighborhood is going to be completely uninhabitable in uh, 50 years or so or even in their lifetime. And so I think it's very important to uh, communicate this information to people and really put into perspective that climate change is not only happening in these rural areas or these foreign countries, like it's going to happen in these urban areas that we all live in. Um, and uh, yeah, so I really thank you for your presentation. And again, further putting this into perspective for us, um, I do have one question for you, um, and I know you've traveled throughout the Chesapeake Bay area and you've shown us some of your pictures, um, but what are some of the most alarming changes that you have observed from sea rising levels? Like any alarming pictures or anything mm -hmm. that really gave you like that moment of like, wow, this is really happening right now? I mean, I wouldn't call myself a climate refugee, uh, mm -hmm. but you know, Dr. Alley was showing the pictures from Florida and Fort Lauderdale. I went to high school in Fort Lauderdale. I grew up down there. Um, and we moved up here, my wife and I, and brought our child about 10, 11 years ago because we've lived through many hurricanes, Hurricane Charlie, Wilma, Francis, Jean, and I, I can't even name them all. And I was just, I was, I, I couldn't stand it, you know, the stress all the time. And I, I know we focused here on sea level rise, but another one of the, the main, uh, consequences of sea level rise is more frequent and stronger uh, hurricanes. And of course, Nicole is showing that now. We haven't had a hurricane hit the United States in November in over four, in 40 years, okay? Um, we just had one 43 days ago with, with Ian. And so, uh, but, but around here, I mean, you go out uh, and you see pictures like, uh, you know, uh, in Dor southern Dorchester County there, that, that area that I showed you where it's uh, expected to convert. And you see where over the last 100 years, it's already lost a good amount of land. You know, you look out at what looks like a huge lake and they have a kiosk there. It's at uh, Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge. There's a kiosk with old aerial kind of satellite photos and it shows you everything that you were looking at was dry land you know, within a, a life, not even a lifetime earlier. Um, and that really, if you get a chance to take a field trip out there, uh, that that really is ground zero for seeing the impacts today. I mean, it, it's, um, you feel, uh, you, <laughs> you feel that climate change is, is here with us, it's happening. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, no, Amy. Thank you so much for sharing. Go ahead, Laura. <laughs> I, I was just gonna add, um, uh, share with you that we are getting some questions in the chat. And I think the first one that I see is, what do Dr. Alley and Mr. Cox hope will happen at COPE 27? I, I mean, I can try. I hope they get serious. Um, you know, it's, as, as I said, I, I served on this committee with, with Bill Nordhaus, who won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2018. And at this point, hard-nosed economics, serious, business-friendly, uh, growth is assured kind of economics as we are hurting the economy because we're under-investing in climate change. Um, just, there are ethical reasons, there are environmental reasons, there are national security reasons, but there's, there's economic as well. And so doing the things that will help us seems wise. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> Jeremy, do you want to mm -hmm. add? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think what you've seen over the years is growing action. You know, the first IPCC 20 odd years ago was like, you know, the first agreement was we will start thinking about doing something. And I think how far we've come since then is, uh, you know, when you put it all in perspective, you, it gives you some hope. It's been way too slow. But um, yeah, I think I'd like to see more of a reframing of the discussion away from we need to accept this this pain, you know, for the future that, you know, we have to completely uh, destroy our economic system 
you know, to save the planet. And I, I think you mentioned at the top of your presentation there, it, it is in a lot of ways, um, a lot of opportunity out there for creating jobs, mm-hmm. creating new industries, for rebuilding um, areas that have been hurt because of, you know, the, the fading fossil fuel industries. Um, you see, you hear politicians talk about that, but I, I would like to actually see that, okay, be accepted, be embraced, and then put into action. Mm-hmm. Another quick question from um, Karen. Uh, she says, what would the foreign scenario mean in DC? And this is probably more towards you, Mr. Cox. Um, but I'm not sure if you... The, the four foot four. scenario? Well, oh, sorry, oh, God, four yeah. foot. <laughs> okay, yeah. I can show you. Yeah. Well, he's finding it. I mean, the the cherry trees are already starting to die around the tidal basin because Mm -hmm. saltwater is intruding on their roots. And that's with four inches. And now he's going to find you four feet. (laughs) Right. It's a wonderful resource. Yeah. Uh, It's now you're you're pretty far up, uh, but it's still tidal up here. And so you see the the Anacostia Naval Station, for example, that turns blue, that goes underwater. Uh, Some of this, Mm -hmm. some of the East Potomac uh, Golf Course, and then over here toward um, Hyatt. I'm sorry. um, Sorry. um, uh, I'm blanking out what this is called uh, here. I'm blanking out what this is called here. Sort of up by the. the Arboretum area yeah. here, you see uh, on the uh, east yeah. side of the Anacostia, uh, some of this going That's underwater as well. Kennel, Kennelworth Aquatic um, Gardens are there. I can mm-hmm. see, yeah. yeah. Bladesburg, that's what I was trying to say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so you guys are the lucky ones. It's, it's, uh, uh, the, there's some elevation in DC itself. You know, if you've ever walked around like the National Zoo, it's all uphill, and then you got to walk back down, or it's all downhill, and then you go, oh no, and then you got to walk back uphill. Uh, so it's not quite as uh, visceral as it is like over here on the shore, where we're very low and very flat. As you can see, Southern Dorchester. This is a whole, basically a whole county. Basically a whole county. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, I put the tool in the chat for anyone that's curious to see how that's going to affect them, maybe exactly where they live. Um, I know people still have questions in the chat, um, but one question I think that's important to be addressed, um, and it, it's heavily tied with, you know, one of our sapling schools, which is to expose students to a variety of environmental issues in order to provide students with opportunities for enrichment and exploration in environmental education. And so um, I think a lot of us who are probably who are very invested in this issue and who want to learn more are probably wondering how we can dive deeper into it and if there's any specific resources that you recommend us to explore um, any experiential learning opportunities or even careers that we should uh, research more if we want to become a leader in this area sometime in the near future so this is a question for either one of you yeah I mean the the big thing. I'll I'll start, and then and then if if you'd like to to correct it, Jeremy. Um, the the for you as climate is everything for everyone, and right now we do know that that we can do this. We can build an energy system that will be sustainable. We can build an energy system that will be equitable. Um, fossil fuels are very 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 concentrated in certain places. Sun and wind are basically everywhere. And as a consequence, we can do this, but it takes, we spent a hundred years putting a gas station on every street corner. Now we need in, in 20 years to figure out how to build a charging system that will be better, but it has to be built. And so this is the challenge here, is that all of you for your entire careers will be making the transition to a world that is energy rich, that you can desalinate and pump and water the desert and grow food for everyone. And in a hundred years, we will be energy rich because we'll learn how to do it. But it has to be invented, it has to be built. Um, New houses have to be ready for a, a gasoline car. You're not allowed to vent the garage into the house. 
right now they don't have to be ready for an electric car with 220 in the garage and solar on the roof and there are people spending all kinds of money to make sure that they don't change the building codes so that you have to do that right so there's all this stuff for you to do all of you whatever you go into will be working on this and if you're working in in a hospital you're going to be thinking about how do we have backup power that will work when the hurricane comes and if you're a, an artist or a writer you're going to be thinking how do i help this happen a few of you have to be scientists and engineers we need you most of you are going to be communicators and business people and healthcare workers and other things and you're going to find the win-wins at work and so mm -hmm. so there there's whatever you go into a few of you please come do what jeremy does come do what i do come come do what laura does we need you but the rest of you are going to find the win win wins in your careers and you'll make this happen mm -hmm. yeah uh well said um i i would just i would say the fact that you're watching this right now you're already doing the right thing stay curious about the world around you be open to try new things, uh, to, uh, you know, explore the world around you, travel as much as you can, uh, and you're, you're going to run into opportunities. Uh, it, it begins and ends with curiosity, and that, that I think will save the planet at the end of the day. Yeah, thank you so much. I, you're right. It does begin and end with curiosity. And I think uh, it, starts, it also starts with you know, how we can apply sustainability um, into our interests, um, because at the end of the day, you know, it's it's, you know, climate change is going to affect us in our lifetime and in my lifetime. Um, and so we have to find a way to uh, tie our work to making a sustainable future for all of us socially, economically, politically, environmentally and so on. Um, so I really thank you, Mr. Cox and Dr. Ali for your amazing presentations tonight. Um, there's people in the chat still asking questions. Um, we'll forward you the questions. And also, I, Laura will probably um, talk more about how you can get your questions answered. But I do want to pass it off to her because I want to respect everyone's time. Um, and we do have a few announcements. Very quickly, um, for folks who have questions in the chat, I will copy those down and share them with our panelists and we can see if we can gather a couple of more answers there. I mean, this was just such a wonderful program. I'm so appreciative to you both for um, joining us tonight and sharing such great resources. In the chat, you will see a resource list that I dropped a Google Doc link with some of the some of the information about Thwaites, some information about um, NASA's visualizations of of ice uh, glacier melting, um, also for Maryland, a couple of films which are really important, plus the link to the podcast that Jeremy does. So you want to make sure that you get that. Um, I also wanted to just share with our students who are on with us tonight that. Um, you are most welcome to participate in Saplings. You can learn more at our link tree and fill out an interest form there if you'd like. And let you know that on December 7th, we will be partnering with Montgomery County Public Schools to talk about their um, EV bus rollout and their commitment to moving our bus system to electric buses. So please stay tuned and look at our various social media about the announcements of when and where that's happening and how you can get involved. And finally, just another thank you to One Montgomery Green.